Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is October 19th, 2022. This video is called The Prophetic Psalms. The Prophetic Psalms. I want to start today by reading something from the book of 2 Peter. Chapter 1, I'm going to just read verse 1 and then go down to um, 12 after that. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Very mysterious way to start, wouldn't you say? Have you obtained a faith of equal standing with Peter's? Peter, Peter's faith was great. Peter's faith was outstanding. Peter died for his Savior. Peter died confessing Jesus, and he, so he had a, a great faith. He knew in whom he believed. Going down to verse 12, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, and our Lord, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. So Jesus revealed to Peter that he was about to die. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. So Peter is writing this letter so that those who believe in Jesus will be able to recall specific things that Peter thinks are important. Then he goes on in verse 16, he says, For we, meaning himself and the other apostles, did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. It's so important to understand this. Peter was an eyewitness of Jesus. He's going to tell us something he saw here in a second. But he also saw the crucifixion of Jesus. Verse 17, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This was upon the mount, the mount of transfiguration, where Jesus was transfigured before three of his disciples, including Peter. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter is an eyewitness, telling you that he actually heard this voice from God that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So Peter heard that. He's an eyewitness. He gives his testimony just like a witness in court. This is why it's so important to understand what Isaiah is talking about in chapter 8. To the law, the law of Moses, and to the testimony. That means to all the writings that speak forth the prophecies of God. The testimony it's the testimony of God through men. It is the prophetic word that was written down so that we 
have something upon which to base our faith. That's why this is so important to the law and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, Isaiah says, it is because they have no light in them. So Peter is giving now his testimony. He says, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And then he goes on. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Peter knows that he speaks prophetically when he speaks. When he's writing his letters, he knows that he is writing prophecies. And so he is giving his testimony and he's doing it in the form of the prophetic word. And then he goes on. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation or someone's own understanding of the prophecy that they're giving. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Do you think that Isaiah understood the th most of the things he was talking about in his book? Do you think that David understood the prophecies he was speaking in the Psalms? He spoke prophetically, but those prophecies were not a matter of his own interpretation or his own understanding. That was true for Isaiah, it was true for David, it was true for all of the prophets, for everyone who has written prophetic literature. That is true. Because, verse 21 here of 1 Peter, or 2 Peter chapter 1 says, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit moved them to say these things, but often they had not they did not have a clue what they were saying. And I say this as introduction now to the prophecies of the Psalms. Uh, another thing I want to say before I get into those prophecies is I want to encourage you again to buy a copy of the English Standard Version of the Bible, especially this one that has references. If you look here in the middle of my pages, there's all kinds of references to other scriptures. And one of the great characteristics of this Bible is that if a particular scripture is cited by another writer somewhere else in the Bible, it will say cited in a particular scripture. So in the middle here of this Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, you have lots and lots of references. Most of those verses are not specifically cited, but the idea occurs in, in, somewhere in the verse that is given in the reference. So in chapter 1, or in Psalm 1, there are no citations in any other book of the Bible. The first time you see a citation is in Psalm chapter 2. And so Psalm chapter 2, or the second Psalm, says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against I am and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. In this, in the references for Psalm 2, 
verse 1, it says, cited in Acts chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. Okay, we're going to look at that now. Uh, before I do that, I want to say this. In the, in the Psalms, at the beginning of a psalm, it usually tells you who the author is. In Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, you do not have any author mentioned at all. So, it's kind of surprising now. When you go to Acts chapter 4 and read this, let's read what, what is said here. So, 13 talks about the boldness of Peter and John. And then verse 23 says this, When they were released, so they were put into, well, verse 19 says, But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, so they were released from like a hearing, had not yet, had not been put in jail at this time. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threat and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Did you notice as they were speaking here, they say, as was said through the mouth of our father David, your servant, he said by the Holy Spirit. See, he was, he was moved by the Holy Spirit. And he didn't understand who the Lord's anointed was. He said, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. He didn't know who that was speaking of. But the interesting thing, see, when you go to the New Testament and see this, and you look at your Bible, it doesn't say in Psalm 2 that David wrote it. But they knew that David wrote it. And so the Holy Spirit moved them to write that down. That's what occurred. That's what's written in the book of Acts. Now in the second psalm, I'm not going to hit every prophecy in the um, psalms. In fact, I'm only going to speak about uh, a few of the psalms today that are in the first book of psalms. Psalms are divided into five books. The first book is Psalms 1 through 41. And I'm going to mention just a few of the Psalms today because what I want to do is I want to, I want to encourage you in this very difficult time that we live in. I want to encourage you to stay in the Word of God to remember that the Word of God was written 
by men who were carried along by the Holy Spirit who wrote exactly what God wanted them to say. And that when you read the Bible, you are reading the testimony of God that God wants you to know. And so you need to be diligent as you read and look at references. When you're reading in the New Testament and see that somebody said this, then go back in the Old Testament and read it. Find out where it was. Because a lot of times you're going to get more information about what that verse is dealing with. Now, in Psalm 2, we've got a couple other places where um, the Psalms prophesy about the future. For example, Psalm 2 verse 7 says, I will tell of the decree. I am said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. This is very interesting because that particular verse is cited in three different places in the New Testament. Acts 13, verse 33, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, and Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. And then another very interesting verse is verse 9. Well, I'm going to read 8 and 9 both uh, and start again with 7 because 7 is where the, the quote I just told you about starts. So, I will tell of the decree. I am said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Well, this verse 9 occurs as a prophecy in the scripture also. You see that reiterated in Revelation chapter 2, verse 27, with respect to a promise to one of the to the overcomers in one of the churches. Then you see it in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, with respect to the promise to the man-child, to those who will be part of the first fruits, um, the first fruits overcomers who are fully manifested uh, like Christ. And then also in Revelation 19, verse 15, when Jesus returns on the white horse to judge the nations. So you see that verse occur three times in the verse in the book of Revelation. The next psalm I want to speak a little bit about uh, uh, from is Psalm 19. Just an amazing, amazing psalm. This is a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Okay, the heavens declare. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims his handiwork. These are words talking about speech, speaking. Day to day pours out speech. So the heavens every day declare God's glory. The sky every day speaks of God's handiwork. And night to night, the heavens reveal knowledge. Then in verse 3, it says, There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. In other words, if anyone speaks aloud, someone can hear that voice. Well, the heavens speak in their own type of voice. And their voice can be heard if you're watching, if you're looking. 
their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So in other words, the voice of the heavens, the testimony that is written in the heavens, and there are several good books about the testimony um, in the stars. The constellations tell a story, the story really of the history of the earth, and it, it tells the story of Christ and um, Satan, and on and on. The testimony has been written in the heavens. So, the proclamation of the heavens, the declaration of the heavens, is the testimony of God. Now in verse 7, suddenly there's a, there is a movement to a new theme. Suddenly it says, the law of I am is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of I am is sure, making wise the simple. Isn't that interesting? At the very beginning of Psalm 19, you have the testimony mentioned. In verse 7, it moves to the law of the Lord being perfect. And then it again mentions the testimony. Then he uses some other words. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. What? By what are we warned? In keeping what is their great reward? The law. The law is still relevant. We all should, we all should desire to have the law of God written upon our hearts. That's the new covenant. See, that's the new covenant. Do you desire to obey God's law from your heart? If you don't, then you have to, you really have to doubt your own salvation. You really have to doubt whether or not you have really believed in Christ. Because that's the new covenant. That's the new covenant that we learn of in Jeremiah and the book of Hebrews, that I will write my law upon your hearts and upon your mind. You will do God's law from your in, innermost being. It's not that I have to struggle and try to not murder uh, and on and on, not steal, not... Uh, lie, not commit adultery. Those are on my heart. I don't want to do those things. But we have to, see, we have to come into agreement with God. How did that, how did that law become written on my heart? It became written upon my heart because I ate God's word. It became written upon my heart because I consumed Christ's flesh and drank his blood spiritually. The law of God is written upon my heart because that has been my diet for 46 years. Daily. That is my diet. That's what I eat. That's what I fill my mind with. That's what I fill my heart with. The law of God is written upon my heart. And so it should be with each one of us. And that's how we know that we have enough oil for what's coming. We want to be of the five wise virgins. We are coming into the most difficult time that has ever existed upon the face of the earth. And 
God has put some of us under incredible pressure over the last year or two to get us ready, to make us ready for this. Now let's go. Psalm chapter 2 was quoted. Um, I'm sorry, I'm on 19 now. So Psalm 19 was quoted. In Romans 10, 18. So let's look at 10, 18. Romans 19, 4 says this. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So then we'll go to Romans 10, 18. Now, an interesting thing, Paul makes a big change in the book of Romans in chapter uh, 9, 10, and 11. He moves from a real theological analysis of becoming a son of God, which culminates at the end of chapter 8. And then suddenly he moves to talking about natural Israel. And he is, he's trying to make people understand uh, the difference between natural Israel and now Christians and what's going to happen with natural Israel. In verse 12, of chapter 10, he says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless... They are sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now that's uh, citing uh, a verse of scripture. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And then Paul says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That's how we come to faith, is through hearing the word of Christ. But then Paul says this, But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For, and now he quotes Psalm 19, For their voice has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Now see, what that's saying is that Everyone has had an opportunity to hear the word of Christ. How? Through the heavens, if not through a preacher that went directly to them. Have you ever wondered why Satan works so hard to obscure the skies these days? He works so hard to obscure the heavens It's because he knows that the heavens declare the glory of God. And so we have chemtrails now covering the heavens constantly, keeping people from understanding that we live beneath a firmament. You know, it's not that the earth is moving. It's not that the earth is rotating. It's that the heavens are rotating over the earth. Why have the constellations not changed over these thousands of years since we've had the scripture? Why do we still see Orion, Pleiades? Why do we still see the same constellations that the Greeks, the Romans, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians saw? 
Do you think if we were really in a big bang and the earth and the whole universe was just shot out, do you think that those constellations would continue to be exactly the same? I mean, they're exactly the same to the minute. We know exactly when constellations will appear. It's not exactly the same amount of time as the sun. I believe it's four minutes shorter than the sun, the time of the sun. It's called a sidereal day. So it's a shorter period of time. So the constellations do not always appear at the same place on the earth at the same time every day. It changes a little bit by four minutes every day. But there is a pattern that is always the same. It's this constellation, then this constellation, then this constellation. And it never changes. Why? Well, go back to Genesis chapter 1. When God is creating the earth, he made the stars and the sun and the moon for signs in order to explain things. They are part of God's testimony to the law and to the testimony. So in Psalm 19, we see the heavens give a testimony and then immediately David goes and talks about the law of the Lord is perfect. Now let's go to Psalm 22. Now if you've never seen this, this is, this is so profound. Psalm 22 begins like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you ever remember hearing that? Yes, of course. It was when Jesus was on the cross. Why do you think he said that? I believe he said it to draw your attention, to draw everyone's attention to Psalm 22. Well, why? Because Psalm 22 describes the crucifixion of Jesus. Psalm 22, I want to give you the references. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27, verse 46, and Mark 15, verse 34. But that's not the only time one of the verses from Psalm 22 is cited in the New Testament. But I want to read Psalm 22 to you because... I was blown away by this when I first saw it, when I was reading through the whole scripture. Because I had read through the New Testament several times by the time I got to this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. All who see me mock me. Jesus was mocked, remember? They make mouths at me and they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. That's what the people said to Jesus as they mocked him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. 
On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. Probably speaking of demons right now, I would say. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. You know, when he hung on the cross, all of his bones went out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. And that's what they did. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. And there's the other verse that is specifically referenced. That was in the book of John, when the soldiers divided Jesus' garments into four parts. But his tunic, and this is very interesting, this is in the book of John, his tunic was seamless, a seamless garment, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Thus they cast lots for the tunic, that one piece that they didn't want to tear, in order to fulfill Psalm 22, verse 18. Now, that seamless garment, that tunic, is also a prophetic picture. Remember, all of Scripture is a parable. There is meaning upon meaning in the scriptures. Don't limit yourself to just one interpretation or one meaning of a particular scripture. It's, the word of God is parabolic. That means that it just goes on and on and on. That the words have this fulfillment and this fulfillment and this fulfillment. And the seamless garment is a description, is a parable of the scripture. It's a seamless garment. I can start here and suddenly I'm over here. I can go there and then I'm down here and then I'm over here. And I never move away from that one garment, that one word, that one scripture. It's all within the scripture. It's all the word of God. And so it describes the seamless garment that Jesus wore, describes his word. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Psalm 22. Amazing. An amazing, amazing scripture. Then I just, I wanted to mention Psalm 37, and I don't believe that Psalm 37, oh, it has one, there is one citation, and that's from verse 11. But Psalm 37 is one really to read today, read in this time. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust and I am, and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in I am, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to I am. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before I am, and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. 
for the evildoer shall be cut off, but those who wait for I am shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in abundant peace. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 5, the meek shall inherit the earth. So that's the only citation from Psalm 37, but Psalm 37 is a psalm um, that we can take comfort in. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. This great plan that the leaders have for us is going to come back upon them. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but I am upholds the righteous. I am knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of I am are like the glory of the pastors. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Those blessed by I am shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a man are established by I am when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for I am upholds his hand. I have been young, but now I am old. David, King David said this, I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Amen. <clears throat> and the psalm goes on a bit. It's a, it's a very wonderful psalm, a powerful, powerful psalm. And then I just want to go to one more today. And this is, this is exceedingly powerful as well. Psalm chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Who's speaking here? Jesus, of course. And so this... was cited in Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to I want to go to that now. We'll read from Hebrews chapter 10. I'll just start in verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It, the law, can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. This is why the sacrifices ended. This is why the ceremonial law ended, but the moral law has never ended. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. 
In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. So when Christ came into the world, he said this, and this was a quote from Psalm chapter 40. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings, and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then Jesus added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. In other words, Jesus did away with the ceremonial law. He did away with the burnt offerings, the sin offerings, all of the blood sacrifices. And by his will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. This is why, because one sacrifice, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. I want to continue reading because this flows with what I spoke earlier in this message today. And the Holy Spirit also says, also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. There's one sin offering, and that's Jesus. Verse 14 says that by his single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Those who are being set apart. Do you set yourself apart or do you just take part in the world? To be sanctified means to be set apart as holy for God's use. Are you being sanctified? Do you make decisions according to the word of God? that separate you from the world, separate you from worldliness? Have you come out of Babylon? Have you stopped partaking of the Babylonian system that tries to titillate you with everything except the truth of God? Are you still involved with all of the things of the world, the sports, the television programming, the movies, the concerts, going out to eat all the time, going to dances. Are you always being bombarded by the things of the world and wanting to partake of the things of the world? And then do you do things that the world says you have to do? And you know what I'm talking about. So that you continue taking part of the world so that you can continue being part of Babylon. If you still do that, then you're not being sanctified. And then what does that mean? You haven't been perfected for all time. I'm going to go toward, well, I'm going to go down just to chapter 26. This will bring it together. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, and partaking in Babylon is 
to continue sinning deliberately. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. What? There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. You mean Jesus' sacrifice doesn't apply to me then? There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Anyone who sets aside the law of Moses. How many churches tell you that you're, you're not under the law, you're, you're free. You're free to disobey the law, basically is what they're saying. They don't come out and just say, you're free to, you're free to then list and then list all the Ten Commandments and say you're free to do all this. And they won't come out that blatantly. But they basically teach that. You're free. You're free to disobey the law. No. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Oh, but that was the Old Testament. Oh, really? Okay. Verse 29. How much worse punishment, do you think, will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, when you first came to know Jesus, when you repented of sins, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. But we are of those who have faith and preserve our souls. Father, I pray that you would give us faith so that our souls can be preserved. Father, fill us with your spirit in this very difficult time. Give us ears to hear your voice. Give us eyes to see your truth. Give us a willing heart of obedience to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.